During the spring 2011 federal election, Prime Minister Stephen Harper announced that Canada's new Office of Religious Freedom would become a key pillar of Canadian foreign policy. In February 2013, the office, aimed at protecting religious minorities around the world, opened its doors within the Department of Foreign Affairs with an ambassador at the head. And that man joins us now. Here is Andrew Bennett. He is the ambassador of the Office of Religious Freedom. And it's nice to meet you and have you here at TVO. Thank you very much for the welcome, Steve. Let's do a little background here. I want to read just a bit from your office's charter to give people a sense of what it is that you do. So control room, if you would. In Canada's view, freedom of religion or belief, including the ability to worship in peace and security, is a universal human right. Through the Office of Religious Freedom, Canada will continue to work with like-minded partners to speak out against egregious violations of freedom of religion, denounce violence against human rights defenders, and condemn attacks on worshippers and places of worship around the world. A Canada-based ambassador and a team of officials will carry out the office's mandate, which is to protect and advocate on behalf of religious minorities under threat, oppose religious hatred and intolerance, and promote Canadian values of pluralism and tolerance abroad. Put us sort of back at the original moment when your office came into existence. What events were happening around the world that provoked its creation? Well, I think the, the need for the office to be established is based on what we're seeing, Steve, as a trend generally uh, in the world, and that has been increasing persecution of people of faith. And that's not simply social hostility, sectarian violence that you might find in a country such as Nigeria or, or Pakistan, but also increasing government restrictions on people's ability to practice their faith, not only in private, but openly. And we've seen this trend increasing over the last number of years. Um, different governments in a variety of countries around the world have been increasing restrictions on, on different religious communities. And so the government, the Canadian government, saw this trend along with a number of other of our allies, such as the United States and the UK, and felt that it was important for Canada to speak out because, as you know, Canada has been a long defender of, of human rights in the world, and it was right that Canada should speak on freedom of religion. Are you thinking mostly despotic countries around the world? I don't know if despotic would be the, the term I would use, but certainly a, a number of the countries that we're engaging uh, have authoritarian regimes, uh, so whether that's uh, Iran or China. Um, or countries that are going through particularly difficult transition periods right now. We're also interested in, in dealing with situations around religious freedom in Burma and also in Egypt. How about, can I get real snarky here right sure. away? Sure. How about in Quebec? <laughs> well, I mean, this is a, this is a question that, that comes up quite often. And I think it's important for Canadians to realize that when we're speaking about religious freedom from our perspective in the office, uh, our mandate is to focus on religious freedom overseas. And there we're looking at people being imprisoned, tortured, and killed so this for the is practice not a question of their faith. Of, not a question about being able to wear a yarmulke while you're serving the public in a public service job. No, that, that's right. It's not, it's not that sort of question. Um, but I think it's important to note that one of the reasons why we can advocate for freedom of religion overseas in countries such as the ones I just mentioned um, is because we have freedom of religion here in Canada. You know, the courts, uh, legislators, uh, Canadian citizens have been defenders of freedom of religion. Um, and so we build upon that experience that we have in Canada of a pluralist, multi-faith, multicultural society, and we take that out into the world and present that to other countries. Uh, and if you find out after your investigation that in fact there is a country around the world that is being um, improper or if you want to use this word evil in the way that yeah. it is persecuting people uh, of faith, uh, what can you do about it? Well, there are a number of different tools that we can use. Uh, some of them are the classic diplomatic tools of uh, policy, so issuing policy statements, condemning actions that take place, and we've issued a number of those in countries as uh, diverse as, as Egypt, as Pakistan. Um, so that's sort of the classic sort of diplomatic role. We can issue those statements. We can engage uh, foreign governments. Um, I'm, I've been traveling abroad, meeting with foreign governments, and speaking out on issues of religious freedom that Canada is concerned about. Um, we can also work with our allies, such as the U.S., um, the United Kingdom, uh, and other countries that are emerging as champions of religious freedom, including uh, France, Germany, and some countries that, in the global south, Senegal is a great champion of religious freedom, and Brazil is also uh, going in this way. So we can work with them. And then also, uh, our budget is a $5 million per year budget, of which the vast majority, $4.25 million, is dedicated to programming. And so we're going to be launching a series of projects in different countries uh, to help advance interreligious dialogue um, with some concrete goals, not just talking shops. Do you get FaceTime with the PM? 
I've, I've met with the Prime Minister once, and that was when the office was created on uh, February 19th. Okay, because I'm wondering if you would... I'm imagining a circumstance where you've discovered some egregious violation mm -hmm. of, of religious freedom in some country overseas. Would you, go, would, would you be able to go to the Prime Minister and say, this rises to such a level, I think you need to get involved, I think you need to you know, potentially put military action on the table, or I don't know, whatever your recommendations mm -hmm. are, but could you do that? Well, I think certainly, you know, the Prime Minister, I know this is a priority for him. It's not, uh, I mean, it's also a priority for Minister Baird, you know, who I report to at Foreign Affairs. Um, and they've both been very active in speaking out about religious freedom issues. Uh, certainly in the case of their relationship and a very complex relationship we have with China, um, both the Prime Minister and Minister Baird, whenever they raise issues related to our commercial relationship, our bilateral political relationship with the Chinese, they'll raise freedom of religion and other human rights issues. So I think you know, the Prime Minister and, and Minister Baird and other ministers in the government are very attuned to uh, these issues. And um, I've certainly, in my, my 10 months now in the job, um, I've received tremendous support from not only the political uh, side of things in Ottawa, but also from uh, within the civil service, within foreign affairs. Let me pick up on the China example, because mm. you know, a after, some, after a pretty rough start, everybody seems to think it was a pretty rough start, this government, this conservative government, has tried to repair relationships with China, has tried to get on better terms with China, and yet <clears throat> it has also, and I presume your office has also, talked about the need to protect the Uyghur Muslims yes. who are persecuted there, yes. and Tibetan Buddhists who are persecuted there. Um, does that complicate matters? I don't think so. I, I mean, I've had a chance now to meet with uh, Uyghur groups here in Canada and also with Tibetan Buddhists. Um, you know, Canada has, as our, part of our foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China, we have a one-China policy. Um, so we're not engaging in discussions with these communities on various claims that they might have vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, the integrity of China. But we can certainly engage with them, as I have, on the religious freedom questions. Um, and Tibetan Buddhists, uh, Uyghur Muslims, uh, even Han Chinese who are, who are Muslims, mm -hmm. Falun Gong, Christians, they all have a fundamental right to be able to practice their faith. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the Chinese government has very significant restrictions on, on that ability. So is it problematic for us, on the one hand, to say, please do more business with us, but on the other hand, please treat your people better? I don't think they're, I don't think they're um, divergent. I think we can have, uh, as we do with many, many countries, um, a multi-voiced, multi-pronged approach in our foreign policy. We can speak out about human rights. We have a mature relationship with the Chinese. Um, and I think, uh, you know, they might not like what we have to say on, on certain issues around human rights, but we need to say them. There's the Pew Forum for Religion in Public Life. It's a survey, 197 mm -hmm. countries. You're well aware of the findings, but let me share some of them with our viewers as well because they surveyed first in 2007 and then again in 2010. Let's bring these up, control room. Looking at Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists, and in, under various circumstances, they found that three quarters of the world's population lived in countries <clears throat> with high government restrictions on religion or high social hostilities involving religion. Uh, that's up from 70% in 2007. When you take all those numbers and add them up, that's the way it works. So it's, it's, the arrow is pointing in the wrong direction, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, what parts of the world are you most concerned about right now? Well, I would say that, uh, I mean, a lot of the countries that we're focusing on are in um, Asia uh, and Africa. Um, we're looking at uh, a number of different countries of very large populations, such as, as China, uh, as Pakistan, um, and then also in Nigeria, as I mentioned, I think. Um, so there are, there are countries where you have, again, these two aspects of uh, freedom of religion being, being violated. One is these government restrictions. The other is social hostilities. A country like China, as I said, you've got very high government restrictions. A country like Nigeria, very limited restrictions, but you have great social hostility between the, the population that is evenly split between Christians and Muslims. You have countries such as Egypt uh, and Pakistan where you have both challenges, mm -hmm. both government restrictions and uh, social hostilities. So um, we've looked at the, the Pew Forum's findings, and uh, we're pretty much in, 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 in sync with them. And we've actually used uh, their indicators on government restrictions and social hostilities to help inform our work, along with using uh, information that we received from our missions in the field. There are some people who believe there is no God. Hmm. Do you look out for them as well? That is their belief. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's consistent with freedom of religion. Freedom of religion, Steve, really does mean um, the freedom to worship uh, in peace and safety, publicly, privately, 
the freedom to openly express your faith in public or private, the freedom to engage in missionary activity if that's what your religion calls you to. And I think what the acid test is, is the freedom to change your faith or the freedom to uh, not be coerced to change your faith. And in that is the freedom to choose to not have a particular religious faith. And you look out for them too? Absolutely. I mean, I think we need to recognize that the vast majority of people who are facing persecution in the world today are people of faith when we talk about freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. But there are communities of atheist bloggers that want to be open about um, their questioning or their, their, uh, their atheism or their secular humanism. Um, I actually spoke out in a recent uh, speech about uh, one atheist blogger in Central Asia who's, who's facing significant challenges because he's not conforming to you know, the Islamic understanding of his particular country. Um, so we're conscious of that, and I think uh, Canadians need to be aware that the office speaks out on behalf of all faith communities that are facing persecution, including you know, communities of, of people who choose not to have religious belief. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a bit about you? Absolutely. You're a person of faith. Very devout faith. Uh, in fact, I've got a little bit on you here, if I may. <laughs> You're a Catholic. Yes. You are the subdeacon and cantor with both the Holy Cross Eastern Catholic Chaplaincy. Am I okay so far? Yes. And the St. John the Baptist Ukrainian Catholic Shrine in Ottawa. Okay, that's a very long title. Um, <laughs> but given that you yourself are Catholic, mm -hmm. I guess some people are going to wonder whether you are, you know, in particular looking out for violations against Catholics around the sure. world uh, as opposed to other faiths? Well, let me say, uh, I guess, three things on that. First of all, I'm a, I'm a public servant. I've spent um, my career thus far, 12 years, uh, as a public servant in Ottawa. And as public servants, we have a responsibility to represent and speak out in our work on behalf of all Canadians. Um, the fact that I'm a Catholic absolutely informs my work. It, it can't not but inform my work. Um, Anyone who would be in this position, whether they are a Catholic or uh, a Muslim or a Buddhist or uh, a secularist, uh, an atheist, they're going to bring their own perspective to the, mm -hmm. to the position. Um, my perspective happens to be a, a Catholic perspective. But I think that that gives me, um, if I can be a bit maybe cute, a Catholic view of things, a universal small C uh, Catholic. view of things. Small C Catholic, that's right. And one thing I found, I mean, as, I, as you mentioned at the, at the beginning, the focus here is on, on foreign policy, on Canada's foreign policy and speaking out about freedom of religion overseas. But part of my work is a necessary sort of a domestic outreach to different faith communities to understand what their thoughts are on freedom of religion abroad. And it's interesting, Steve, it doesn't matter which community I've engaged, whether they're Christians or Buddhist or Jewish or whatever they might be, um, they don't really know me from a hole in the wall when I, when I first met them. They think, oh, he's an ambassador, civil servant, academic. Um, but then in our discussion, when they find out that I'm a man of deep faith, even though I'm a Catholic, all the barriers sort of drop. And we can have a very rich discussion, not only on freedom of religion, but on faith and what that means um, and how it's important to defend uh, our inherent right to, to profess our faith overseas. Well, 53 years later, can I ask you the John F. Kennedy question? <laughs> sure. Which, you know, of course they asked him, yeah. you know, when push comes to shove, are you really there for the American people or are you there as a representative of the Pope? And I guess the similar question for you would be, uh, what happens when your public responsibilities come into conflict with your religious responsibilities? What then? Well, I can't, I can't maybe necessarily envisage a hypothetical situation, but I, I cannot divorce my Catholic faith from who I am as a public servant. It informs everything. Um, and my role as Ambassador of Freedom of Religion is to fulfill the mandate I've been entrusted with uh, by, by the government, by Minister Baird, to serve him as best I can. Well, here's where it comes up. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, sure. as a Catholic, I assume you'd have to be against same-sex marriage but then there would be potentially religious gays somewhere in the world mm -hmm. who may be persecuted sure. because they are attempting to get married. Mm -hmm. That might put in conflict your personal religious views mm -hmm. with your public service responsibilities. How would you handle that? Well, here's where we get into the question of how I think different rights interlink. Um, freedom of religion does not exist in and of itself. Uh, it has to dovetail with other fundamental freedoms. Um, you know, I have my own personal views on, on issues such as same-sex marriage. Did I, on, did I accurately characterize it? I'm a Catholic. I'm okay. a faithful Catholic. Enough said. Um, but, you know, it's important, I think, to recognize that any people who are uh, unjustly persecuted, um, we need to speak out for them. We need to defend them. So whether we're speaking about, um, you know, people who are, are homosexual, 
in a country such as Uganda, and the, you know, the government's been very active on this. Minister Baird has spoken out on, on that particular case. Um, whether we're speaking about um, you know, uh, young girls who are being forced into marriages in certain parts of the world, whether we're speaking about uh, Christians being persecuted, at the core, it's a question of human dignity. And uh, freedom of religion is fundamentally, Steve, not a theological issue, it's a, it's a human issue. And when we get right down to it, it's about recognizing that every human being has the inherent right and dignity to be able to consider who am I? Who am I in relationship to others? Who am I in relationship to this world we all live in? Who am I in relationship to God or to a particular philosophy I may choose uh, to support? So human dignity must be at the crux of that. And as a Catholic, um, you know, the, the, the church and, and Christians generally have always had an emphasis on the dignity of the human person. Uh, and that, that informs very much my work. Okay. Can we talk some politics here in our last few minutes? <laughs> you can't say no. You're, you're stuck here. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, it, it is unusual in this country for the government to uh, legislate in the area of religion. And when the, the Harper government did this a couple of years ago, it did catch some people, uh, some people found it very new, noteworthy, very newsworthy. Here's what Jeffrey Simpson wrote in the Globe and Mail uh, almost a year ago. He wrote, the Harper conservative's latest brainchild, an ambassador for religious freedom, is supposed to criticize other countries' lack of protection for religious minorities. These critiques will have zero effect on the intended targets, but they will be wildly popular with domestic religious groups who are the real political targets. You can be sure that the announcements from this new ambassador will feature prominently in the church groups in Canada that are the Post's principal targets to say nothing of conservative MPs' household mailings in ridings where religiosity counts. It is guaranteed that the ambassador's various pronouncements will receive far more attention in these selected slices of Canada than in any of the countries targeted by him or the government. Let's get into this. How do you respond to that? I would disagree with Mr. Simpson. You know, I think obviously there are those uh, people of faith, whether they're Christians, whether they're Jews, whether they're Muslims in Canada, who are very supportive of our, of our office, and I'm grateful for that. Um, but we also have, I think, the offices supported um, within Ottawa. Uh, I took a step very early on with, with Minister Baird's permission to engage uh, the different party caucuses in Parliament. Uh, parliamentarians have a, a fundamental role in our society for upholding our values, upholding our freedoms. Um, I've received you know, uh, positive uh, feedback from them, uh, from the different parties. Um, and fundamentally, this is about human rights. And I well, think, that's not what he's getting at. He's saying fundamentally this is about domestic politics. Well, I would disagree with him. Um, and if I can use a couple of examples, um, it has not, it has had uh, some effect. I think to say zero effect is a bit uh, overstating it. Um, we had a situation where a prominent uh, Muslim human rights activist in Sri Lanka uh, was arrested by the Sri Lankan authorities, um, ostensibly under their, uh, their sort of... Um, uh, Prevention of Terrorism Act, which is sort of a catch-all for all sorts of uh, spurious investigations and arrests. Um, Azath Sali is his name. Uh, he was arrested and was held um, and was not really being given full access uh, to, to his, his legal rights. And he had been a very outspoken critic of the government and a defender of the Muslim minority in Sri Lanka. Um, I issued a statement under our office uh, condemning his arrest, condemning, condemning his, the treatment that he was, was being afforded while being held. Um, we spoke with the Sri Lankan ambassador to Canada, the High Commissioner to Canada, uh, raising our concern about this, raising our concern about how different religious minorities are treated in that country. Um, Mr. Sali was subsequently released several weeks after. His first stop after his release was to the Canadian High Commission in Colombo to thank Canada mm. for speaking out. So it had an impact. It has an impact. Okay, let's, let's give you that in our last minute here. Um, you, listen, I just met you, but you seem like a very upstanding, thoughtful guy who's in the job for the right reason and all of that stuff. Sure. But are you going to be a little disturbed if in 2015 when the conservatives <laughs> are out there on the hustings and they've got your good works in their literature, in those faith communities Jeffrey Simpson just talked about, campaigning on the fact that you've done all of this they would argue for them. I mean, they may use your accomplishments for domestic political gain. How would you feel about that? Well, I mean, you would have to speak to uh, Don't dodge someone, it. Come someone on, with the Conservative Party. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a, you know, again, Steve, I mean, I'm a public servant. I'm not, I'm not a, a partisan political actor. I've been given a mandate. 
Um, you know, you can ask Minister Baird, you can ask the Prime Minister, you can ask other members I'm of the Conservative. I'm asking you. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's their priority, I guess, as the governing party when they go out, um, you know, to campaign for, for election, to place whatever they wish in, in, their, in their material. Um, other parties presumably do the same thing. Um, but as I said before, I would hope that given my interaction that I've had with, with other uh, MPs and senators, that they would see that what we're doing is good for Canada. It's, it's, not, it's not a, from my perspective as a, as a public servant, it's not a partisan thing. Uh, it's something that Canada does, um, defend human rights. So you think this office would survive a change of government if that were to happen? I would hope so. I would hope that we would establish it well within the Department of Foreign Affairs, within Canada's broader foreign policy, and that all Canadians can see themselves reflected in our work. Andrew Bennett, it's good to meet you. Nice to meet you Thank as well, you Steve. Thank you for coming into TVO. That's Andrew Bennett, the ambassador in the Office of Religious Freedom at the Department of Foreign Affairs. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.